wired into technology transformation, this is the Digital Bulletin Podcast. Hello listener, thank you for joining us for what is episode 21 of the Digital Bulletin Podcast. Propping me up for today's show, we have two of the sturdiest pillars in the B2B publishing industry, namely Digital Bulletin Content Director James Henderson. Good afternoon, thanks for that. Um, slightly odd introduction. I don't think I've ever been called a pillar before. A pillar of the industry, mate. That's that's what you are. Okay. Um, yeah. And another pillar of industry of all sorts. It's our CEO Romley Broad. Of all sorts. I, what's that supposed to mean? I, I feel to, to your and the listeners' imagination. Right. Okay. <laughs> how are you, chaps? James, how are you? I know you're not feeling great. How are you going to pull through? Yeah, a bit under the weather, but you know nothing could. Nothing could stop me making a return to the Digital Bulletin podcast, certainly not a mild cold. It's the most important appointment in your diary, we know that. Exactly, exactly. And Rom, how are you? Are you over the high of Legoland at the weekend? Well, that was a revelation. Uh, I enjoyed looking at a sequence of 25-year-old Lego sculptures that had been duly weathered and moulded, uh, as in en moulded as in full of mould, uh, are you just saying it needs a transformation? It does, not just a digital one. Um, it needs a Lego transformation, uh, which, you know, happily my son has informed them he's more than happy to oblige. So, you know, it's all good. Is he going to project manage a Lego revolution at Legoland? Is that his I, dream? I, that is his dream. Yeah, that is 100% his uh, career aspiration. Um, there is nothing deviating him from that course. No. Well... Very exciting. Right, listener, on today's show, we are going to chat over how cloud and data analytics are revolutionizing the sports industry. We're going to review our case study with Saling Group, and we're going to listen back to my interview with Jumio's Chief Product Officer, Bala Kumar. But first, here's your news roundup. It's been another busy month, especially for the cloud hyperscalers. Billions of dollars are being spent by the likes of Microsoft and AWS on new cloud regions. From China to the Middle East, from Europe to North America, data centers are springing up everywhere. It feels like there's some sort of race on right now. It's been a very busy time over the last month in that field. Elsewhere, we have seen Vodafone take a major step on the path to building Europe's first open RAN network. It has selected its key technology partners for the project. So Open RAN is seen as vital infrastructure for the wider rollout of 5G. Another interesting story was Open AI launching its $100 million AI startup fund in partnership with Microsoft. They have promised to make some big bets on some of the most exciting young AI companies in the tech space. We've also seen El Salvador become the first country in the world to formally adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. We've seen McDonald's suffer a pretty major data breach in the Far East. And we've learned that the original code for the internet is set to be auctioned as an NFT. Any bidders, Rom? No, I think NFTs are an appalling idea and I want them to go away. They ain't going anywhere, pal. Um. Right. <laughs> As you know, by now, listener, you can get access to the best reporting on those stories and many, many more via the bulletin on digitalbulletin.com. But now we are going to focus on two topics very close to the panel's hearts, digital transformation and sports. The worlds of sports and technology are crossing over more than ever. And we investigated this trend in a recent feature with AWS in issue 29 of Digital Bulletin. Shortly after that piece was then published, AWS announced a major commercial agreement with Ferrari to deliver an incredibly comprehensive set of technology services to its Formula One team. Now we're going to discuss the, the different ways technologies like cloud and AI are impacting sports. But first, James, we're going to come to you. Maybe you can give us a bit more of an overview of that of that piece because it was really interesting, wasn't it? And some of the key features that came out of it, some of the key themes showed that AWS is taking sports as an industry alongside all the other industries as very seriously indeed. Yeah, it is. And it, it's, a, it's a sort of expansion of, bespoke cloud platforms which we've discussed on 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 the podcast in the publication before where um for some companies of course normal cloud platforms will be fine but increasingly in in manufacturing or in this case in sport or financial services what companies actually want is a bespoke cloud platform which really suits their needs and is is tailored for it um and aws is is going really big on on sport it was 
it, it was a really interesting piece. Our sort of our colleague um, Stuart Hodge wrote it, um, and I was having a, another look at it this morning. And AWS had gone in big, not just obviously F1 was one of the, the the key themes of the piece, but it's not just F1 by any means. That they've they've gone big in the the National Hockey League and. In the United States, the, the PGA Golf Tour, uh, Germany's Bundesliga, the NBA, and the NFL, uh, of course, um, and you know this side of the pond on Six Nations as well. So it's a whole broad spectrum of sports that they're going for. Um, on the F1 piece in particular, the, um, we we included some quotes from, from Rob Smedley, the sort of director of data systems, and he he spoke about how. Um, in each race, there's 2.5 to 3 billion um, individual pieces of of, um, of transponder data per race, and that they're able to sort of boil those down to the stats that, that sit on the screen and um, and sort of able to engage the viewer. So the, it's a it's a combination of services within that cloud, of course, as well. There's analytics, there's big data insights, there's um, machine learning, AI, and I, I guess what it shows is that they see this huge potential for the use of, um, of, of cloud services and, and those, those platforms that I've just mentioned there within sports. It's, it's, becoming, it's becoming absolutely enormous, and I think it's potentially the next big thing in cloud if, if it isn't already. Yeah. And the more obvious use cases, the ones that you talked about there, Formula One, a sport where, you know, it's fueled by data essentially and, and small margins and trying to, to trying to gain competitive edge by any means possible. You can see the obvious use case there. I was really interested in the NFL one as well. Another kind of sport like that where data is used a lot. Do you want to talk a bit more about that one? Yeah, I thought what was interesting there was uh, when um, <laughs> when COVID came around, one of the, one of the huge dates in the diary for the NFL is, is the draft. You know, it's something that, that everyone gets keenly involved in. And there's actually, you know, there's millions of dollars tied up with it as well. Um, so they sort of pivoted as, as we've all had to into the virtual draft, which was sort of supported by, by AWS. And then that's been expanded in sort of in-game stats, um, players wearing sort of radio frequency identification. Um, and all that those stats are sort of fed in, in real time into, into a system. And I think in there they said that there's sort of three terabytes of data being collected per game, um, and and sort of that's been used on both sides of the fence. Actually, that's been used in uh, on terms of the of the fan side, where they're getting sort of in-game statistics being brought to them, um, but that's also been used by the teams as well. Uh, and again, using sort of combining data, data intelligence, machine machine learning, um, to really inform the the teams in, in into performance statistics number one but what i thought was really interesting and in that was they're using those statistics of course in the nfl we know that they've had huge problems in terms of concussions and injuries and you know and that's gone into lawsuits as well but with these these statistics they've, they've been able to make better informed decisions on sort of the likelihoods of injuries and 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 been able to tailor rehabilitation programs for particular players using those stats too so i think again it's Again, on this podcast, we've spoken about, you know, sort of healthcare benefits of technology. I think underpinning all of this sort of impressive glitzy stuff there in terms of in-game statistics and teams been able to use it for, you know, how many yards they can run per 10 seconds and stuff. Actually, underneath that, there's that, I think, uh, something that's going to become really important is being able to, you know, tailor programs and rehabilitation and be able to make better predictions in terms of injuries and stuff like that. I thought that was sort of my main takeaway of it that I thought was, yeah, really interesting. Yeah. You could almost call it tech for good. Couldn't you? Um, Rom, I'm going to come to <laughs> yeah. you on the, on the, on the fan engagement piece as well. Cause, and this is where these technologies are maybe having a more of an impact in the sports. You might not expect kind of tech and, and data to be as influential. Take football, for example, or soccer to our American listeners, um, where, where fan engagement is, you know, it's, it's almost becoming a completely new thing with with the 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 help of data and underneath, you know, data analytics powered by cloud technologies essentially. So, it's mm. it's kind of changing that fan experience, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you know, in the dim and distant past, you you and I certainly may have had a thing or two to do with this. But the, I mean, I suppose I would, in terms of fan engagement, the you can look at it very broadly in two kind of ways. One is what's happening in the stadia, what's happening in the moment when you're actually in attendance at, at a sports event and then what's happening outside of that and how do these things um, 
align to improve a fan engagement what by whatever metrics you, you might measure that but um you know we've, we've got cloud we've got edge computing we've got connectivity um all of which are kind of coming together now to provide new ways of driving that engagement with the fans so if you look at in you know in the stadium itself um there are there are things that fo football clubs certainly and that's something that you know i uh, know a bit more about than perhaps other sports but it's the same everywhere you're looking at tens of thousands of people rocking up into your house once every two weeks and then you know what can you understand about those people in terms of how they move how uh, they tend to spend their money what times do they arrive what times do they leave how do you manage the traffic and you know there's all this stuff there's vast amounts of data that you might be able to pull out of those scenarios um, whether it's from um, you know stadium stadium entry mechanisms like gates and turnstiles and so on through to uh, point of sale in kiosks and shops and things like that. How do you bring all of that data together and analyze it, ideally in the moment, to, to be able to influence the behavior of the people in the ground? Because if you can get somebody to turn up to a stadium five minutes before they would typically do it, you're making... Um, as a as a commercial organization as a sports organization a lot more money that day than you would otherwise have done that that that's a kind of um uh, business intelligence layer to all of this that's a uh, an advanced analytics uh, an, in a commercial sense um how do you improve the fan engagement in the ground well one of the things you can do is is provide them connectivity um it's a massive issue you can't um it's typically very difficult pro to provide connectivity to that many people in such a small space, particularly when often the environments that they're in are old and uh, not very conducive to things like Wi-Fi and signals and things like that. 5G presents an opportunity to suddenly allow connectivity there between those fans, between the stats, between the stuff that's going on, between the highlights clips as they're perhaps being generated automatically by AI in the background. In the stadium, therefore, you've got a, a great opportunity to provide much better levels of experiential kind of quality to things through data and how you work with it. Um, outside of the stadium, um, obviously, there's uh, vastly larger audiences involved in in watching these top level sports. Certainly, you know, how does this play there? But probably the best example is one is actually quite an old one now, and I remember it making headlines at the time. And that was when uh, Wimbledon, as the, the tennis um tournament obviously um back in 2017 i think it was um announced two things one was they were going to just take ownership of all of their broadcast stuff they were going to just do it all in house and manage it themselves and then they hooked up with ibm to use ibm watson to generate highlight clips from games um on the fly and i just uh, this morning i had a look at some stats and they uh, back then, even, they managed to generate nearly 15 million extra views of their highlights clips in an automated fashion um, than than they would have otherwise been able to do. And that was simply by IBM Watson looking at vast amounts of footage and saying and making decisions based on crowd reactions, uh, the noise that was being made, the expressions on players' faces and things like that to generate these clips. Um in a world of social media and you know multi-channel plurality and all the rest of it, if you can leverage systems to make intelligent decisions for you to generate all of that stuff, then you're providing a much wider footprint for people to engage with those sports in the first place. Um, so yes, I've rambled a bit, but there's quite a lot of opportunity, especially now the connectivity piece is uh, is coming in um, coming into into the fore because there's so much of what happens in sport that's that is real time and until you really crack that nut then you know it's a lot of it is retroactive but we're now on the cusp of seeing some really transformative stuff happen i think yeah and it's a convergence isn't it it's, it's interesting you mentioned that wimbledon example because that that does seem quite a while ago now but it it, it was a fairly groundbreaking thing wasn't it and i'm it yeah. still sounds quite impressive and groundbreaking even though you hear a lot more of those kind of use cases now James, another example is, as a sports fan, is the, the presentation of, sort of data and statistics in real time and contextualized to give watchers and viewers um, a more, more kind of insights, I guess, into what is happening in front of them. Do you feel that kind of feeds into a, the wider 
trend we're seeing in the sports industry, which you'll know about as a keen sports watcher of, of data and the use of data to kind of inform decision making trends. We hear about a lot in the more conventional stuff that we cover as well. But data is coming to the fore in sports in many ways, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. And it used to be it used to be like the, uh, you know, the, the fringe sort of nerds were the only people who were interested in this. Maybe people who played a lot of football manager, for example. Um, I think we have a few, few of those in our, in our company. You know, these stats obsessives who, who would, you know, think, I, 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 I joke, I played a lot of football manager and delved into, you know, data and spreadsheets for hours at a time and people did it with football manager. But it did seem to be the sort of fringe thing. But I, I definitely think over the last couple of years, it, it, take football or soccer for an example, you know, it, a couple of years ago, if someone would have talked to you about expected goals or expected shots or something like that, you, you would have looked at them like they were crazy. But now it's, you know, part of the normal vernacular of football. You talk about expected goals and it seems to reach the tipping point. If you think about things like heat maps and, you know, it, how we, how data has been presented to us as, as sports fans. And it's it's become commonplace really quickly. I think in a, ma in a matter of a couple of years, it, it went from you know, something that you wouldn't expect to see. And now, you know, you expect to see it as part of an, an analysis on, on mainstream television. Um, and I think that you also see that on the, on, the, on the side of the sports teams as well. You know, they've got armies of data analysts and data scientists and the backroom staff are as big as the playing staff. Now. And a lot of that is, it, it, you know, data, it, 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 it completely makes up how, how teams go after new stars, for example, how they try and how they try and sign people to their rosters or squads or whatever it is. So, I, I think we've reached a tipping point now on, on both sides of it, where fans expect it, whether they're at home or however they sort of engage with the sport. And I think that on the on the sporting side as well, there's very few um, people within elite sport now who don't sort of recognise the benefits of of data and technology and. Um, and, and big staff to sort of analyse all of that. So, I, I, yeah, it's, it's here to stay, and we're only going to see more of it. To see to see some of the um, ways that data is used now and and is adopted, not just by sports teams and organisations, but is is of interest to the, the average sports fan. It's something that wouldn't have even been conceivable, I think, um, a few years ago. But obviously, just to bring it back to the point around you know we've got all of this data now and all this data that people are interested in whether it's an expected goal or whether it's you know the tire pressure on a formula one car but all of that is only made possible by the the power of the compute underneath it and that brings us back to what we were talking about and the, the final point rom i'm going to come to you on this the, on this question is can all of this cloud cloud technology data artificial intelligence all of those things coming together do you think it can drive genuine improvement in sports performance obviously you can and maybe in like a formula one sense but how about an athlete running the 100 meters do you think that person could benefit benefit from in some way from these technologies and in different use cases across different sports because i'm genuinely interested to think what you guys think about whether it can like almost speed up the rate of improvement uh, absolutely 100 percent. and i think it already is and i think just you know off the top of my head that's the, the the best examples we can think of are probably in terms of um the design of the tools and the equipment that sports people use i think um uh how how much you could say you know a, a advanced computing is is involved in that but you know certainly track athletes at the minute are benefiting um through the constant breaking of world records just because they've got a new design of shoe now um controversially as well we, we should add like, controversially so. as well yeah and but the that that has emerged from obviously some very detailed and very careful analysis of, of what a shoe can do and how you can design it to, to make things better but probably the most in terms of sports performance i.e improving human beings um You've got to say yes. Like so, uh, right now, for example, I'm wearing a smart ring um, that helps. Uh, it, it just monitors various. It, you've got the same thing on a Fitbit. You've got the same thing on an Apple Watch, whatever. But this is a ring. By a, uh, we did a feature about um, some technology innovation things in healthcare in Finland recently, and I, I was inspired. It's a Finnish company called Ura. Anyway, it monitors your biometrics and things like that, but also pays particular attention to sleep and sleep patterns because that's probably the one thing above all that might influence the performance of anybody doing anything 
the next day, but especially sports people. So if you're able to wear very simple devices like that, that can monitor certain health, uh, you know, metrics, then you're going to be able to start doing some very deep level analysis when it comes to elite level sports with things like that, or watches or uh, cameras or on training sessions or the GPS devices that they already wear during training and so on to to monitor their movement levels and you know how much um, effort they're putting in and so on. So applying technology and data to the health and well-being of an athlete to an immense levels of detail is going to make those human beings better over time. Even if that's through a process of elimination where you're saying, here's our squad, um, we're measuring all of these people with all sorts of sensors and we're looking at their nutrition, their sleep patterns, their um, muscular development, uh, their whatever it might be. And actually, here's a third of people that are just not very good human beings. So we'll we'll go and tell them to go and be accountants instead or something. Um, the net, the net, um, you know, quality of the actual uh, athletes that end up remaining are is going to be gradually higher and higher. And I actually, I think you can see a lot of that already. That I think that the, the the level of performance that we see in elite level sports now is night and day over what it was not that long ago. I'm not sure that makes the sport better, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, but you would say they are better athletes. But it feels to me, James, that actually the scary thing is what the potential could be in 5, 10, 15 years as these technologies mature and as as, as the people involved in professional sport use them in ways that probably we can't even imagine right now. Is sports performance just going to keep getting better and better and better until someone runs 100 metres in like no seconds? I said possibly. I mean, it definitely is still in its embryonic stage. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the technologies which they're using, sort of AI and machine learning, are only going to get better because that's literally how they work. You know, the more data you put into them, the better your insights and, and therefore you can make better decisions. So if, if progress has already been made, which evidence would suggest that it is, and we're still quite early in this sort of, sport embracing technology and vice versa then actually it stands to reason in five ten years you're just going to see an acceleration of that trend so christ knows what we're going to see um stuff that we wouldn't have thought possible i, I would imagine but it'll be interesting to watch definitely and just lastly i'm not sure if it'll be the next issue or the issue after but there's a sort of follow-up partner piece to this where we'll be looking at how the olympic british rowing team obviously one of the best you know rowing teams in the world um, is sort of leveraged in cloud and, and technology as well. Um, far be it for me to say that it's an editor just, you know, putting as much sport into a technology publication as possible, but, um, you know, a good story is a good story, sport or not. Well, there are examples that, you know, people like us can understand, right? It's, uh... <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that we, I'm, I'm going to wrap it there, but that was um, really good, guys. Thank you. I felt that sort of that tapped into our collective knowledge and interest in that debate so um <laughs> thank you but it's time for us to move on listener and we'll be swapping sports for retail after this find us as digital bulletin on linkedin facebook and instagram and at digi underscore bulletin on twitter for this month's case study review, we're going to look back at our most recent digital bulletin cover story, our piece with Denmark's leading retailer, Saling Group. Saling Group has hugely successful store and digital commerce businesses in different retail areas. But until COVID-19 hits, one service it hadn't cracked was grocery home delivery. The videos and article are all about why the company decided to make the leap during the pandemic. But before we talk about how they did it, here's Ter Jurgensen. Selling Group's digital and e-commerce leader on the scale of his team's ambition. Everybody who knows the industry understands that the, the general economics around home delivery and food uh, are initially not very strong. So, uh, so it is expensive to, to drive low margin articles all the way home to, uh, to the consumer. So we, uh, of course, have been monitoring uh, the development uh, for, for many years and uh, and, and then last year decided that with the rapid change happening as a, as a result of Corona, the timing was right to move, uh, to move fast into, into that area. So, so the biggest challenge for us was to, uh, to, uh, to start implementing a strategy 
much faster than we had originally planned and with much greater greater speed. So, uh, so we decided to do in six months what we had originally planned to do in uh, 18 or 24 months. Yeah, so as Tor says there, a six month transformation that would normally have taken between 18 and 24 months. Rob, it's interesting, isn't it, that Saling Group, Denmark's biggest reseller, you'd kind of assume that they would have a service, a grocery home delivery service already, but that in itself shows how difficult that is as a service to deliver if they didn't do it, right? And also kind of shows how impressive it was that they did it in the time frame they did during the pandemic. Right, uh, yeah. I mean, it is. It's. it, it seems obvious on the face of it that, that that would be you know the direction of travel for for retailers like Silent Group, but it's 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 not because the the expense and the complexity of it are enormous, especially if what you've got is a really really well established bricks and mortar type operation that you worry about. So well, hang on, if we, I, I would if we allow people to go and buy everything online, are we going to um, lose? sales actually because we've got that customer transacting in a different way are they going to buy less that's not a good thing what happens to all of the expensive things we do in in the physical spaces are less people going to go there you there's lots of reasons why you would resist the temptation to do it and it takes something like a pandemic to come along of course where which enforces those decisions uh, at which point you need to respond and the, and the, the trick for selling obviously was to respond well it's it's obviously there must there was a lot of urgency and a need to act quickly but what they desperately didn't want to do obviously was to deliver some sort of subpar bad experience that would would then ultimately fulfill those nightmares that they'd always had that that brand would be damaged and people would spend less money as a result so it was must have been a, a very difficult and um high stress sort of situation that, that obviously as we know um they they managed to work their way through very successfully in the end but um yeah certainly there's lots of reasons not to do it and you can understand why and from a from a kind of technical and technology perspective as well there are many layers that go into creating this service it's not you know understandably somebody on the outside wouldn't have any idea about you know oh, delivering food to people's doors it can't be that difficult but actually the amount of technical work needed and the piece goes into all of this work from a kind of back end perspective where you're sourcing goods and 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 you know keeping keeping track of stock and, and things like that to, to delivery and, and last mile and all of those kind of things especially when it's groceries as well there's so mm. much there is so much to put together in this jigsaw isn't there yeah i mean there's there's logistics there's engineering uh there's technology and integrations there's becoming experts all of a sudden in e-commerce which is not an easy thing to do um there is how do you um, build the systems and the databases and so on and the understanding of your customer at the end of the line uh, enough to be able to develop a quality service, to be able to do it on time, to make sure that your cucumbers aren't you know soggy uh, because they've been hanging around on shelves too long. There's there's just an an aching plethora of, um, of of variables involved, especially if you're trying to deal with that in a very short space of time. Fortunately, I think selling benefited from the fact that they were able to form very good um, partner relationships with with the suppliers that helped them along the journey in the end and of course we spoke to them too yeah and we're going to touch on that a bit more in a minute but you're right it was um what what really impressed me about the approach generally was that so selling group wanted to create as you said from something that was that worked and was really good right from the offset but they wanted to do that obviously in a really short time frame which is incredibly difficult to create something which is reliable and really good in a short time frame so they fo kind of focused on a small area geographically to kind of launch what they called a minimum lovable product which i really like it's quite a nice phrase a minimum <laughs> lovable product so uh, <laughs> a minimum viable product but something that, that people actually loved and they, they yeah they focused it on a very small kind of geographic area which was um copenhagen and its kind of surrounding um suburbs and that was kind of the the, the test bed almost for this technology and and we'll go go in, in a bit into how it's going to be kind of rolled out and the challenges of rolling out across Denmark um later but James um obviously time and time again during covid we've heard about transformation and and, and transformation being accelerated because of the unique circumstances of the pandemic this is almost this is such a true example of that isn't it this is this is a company who have a big company, so a well-resourced big company who have acted like a startup in a way to just completely from from scratch just build this thing um, in 
a short space of time. Yeah, you, you can you couldn't really get a better example, could you? And I suppose yeah. that the the only thing that you take away, and I think Ron Ron um, explained it really well, is that they didn't have it in place already. But I think in, obviously in this country, we're used to all of the major supermarket brands having that in place. Um, but you know, it took it took all of the, the brands here years to sort of get get that right. So I mean that. That speaks to how much of a complex operation it is, and never mind what what was said in the little clip that you played there in terms of the actual economics of of, of a home delivery service. Anyway, so no, it's, it's a fantastic example of of a of a company. I mean, companies have literally been forced into this, but I guess that it that depends on 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 how they react to it. Are they able to do it well? And you know, I've read the read the story obviously, and um. It, it appears that they have done that. So I think that I think more and more we're gonna we're gonna see examples of of companies actually wanting to come out and shout about what they've been able to achieve and you know and that they've used sort of modern working principles like agile and sprints and stuff like that to make sure that, that they've been able to achieve it as well. So I think that the one of the one of the overriding things that will come out of the pandemic is is proof that companies when they've got their backs to the wall actually are able to to sort of embrace and adopt technology for for the benefit of their customers and, and, and for the long term benefit of their companies as well. So if there's if there is one silver lining, I suppose that, that would be it. Yeah. And the customer point in this example is an important one because this is a direct kind of improvement to customer service. Obviously, their customers want stuff delivered to them because they can't go to shops. Uh, we need to build that product to be able to do that. So it's, it's a very kind of clear example of that. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the long and short of it now is that Selling Group, through its Fertex brand, I think I pronounced that right, is, is successfully operating a grocery home delivery service in Greater Copenhagen. Um, its next step is to launch that service in other cities in Denmark and then in rural areas, which of course presents even more kind of tech and, and logistical challenges when it comes to grocery home delivery. Um, but from a technical standpoint, however, Selling Group is hugely excited by what they've built and the potential to develop further in the e-commerce space, as Stein Kronborg, Chief Enterprise Architect, explains in this clip. So personally, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited because basically now we made a foundation, a strong foundation. Uh, but we also, uh, from a you know from a technical point of view, uh, there are also a little bit feeling say yes, we can do even better, uh, and that really brings some excitement because if you just left alone, but now we're in the playing field, and actually that's driving the excitement. So I'm really looking forward uh, because we are looking into a multi-year competitive space, and for more my personal opinion. <laughs> that's super super exciting right because that, that's uh, now we'll be tweaking we'll be optimizing uh, we will uh, bring in the more design side of it we will the new user experience and it is a new kind of ball game rom a, a couple of kind of points i want to wrap up on you mentioned the partnerships earlier so in order to do all of this work in such a short space of time there's no way that selling group could have even though they've got a fairly significant internal kind of digital and it setup have done done it on their own because you know it would just be impossible um so it's one of the most important kind of or interesting aspects of their approach was how they welcomed partners through open doors i think was the the word that tor used so they basically said look here we go come in come and do this for us and this element of it and the and they kind of just let them get on with it um it's interesting to see how, how, how that worked so well in such a short space of time, isn't it? Um, especially during a pandemic when actually you're not sitting across a table from these people. You've in, probably never met a lot of the people you're working with. Right. I mean, there's the, one of the things that's true time and time again, wh whoever it is we're speaking to, especially when they're trying to do big things under pressure in short amounts of time, is the the effectiveness of those, um, I, I don't know whether to call them supplier partnerships, because uh, there's you can't, it, are you a a partner if you're also a supplier obviously what we're saying here is that there's there are vendors with special expertise and tools and services or products that that people like selling need but that's just one thing that the partnership element is about how you form that relationship and work together to solve a problem and have a common investment in the solution and so and 
when when things fail, it's because it's it's not that way. It's because it's governed by you know costly SLAs and um, transactional kind of contract discussions all the time without actually having that common common purpose. If you see what I mean. Um, what was clear here is that you know we we, we spoke, I believe, to Western Acker, uh, who had a consultative role to play, and uh, Naveo. I'm assuming I'm saying that right, Naveo, um, who have the commerce tools and quite a lot of them that really provided a lot of the the glue that kind of held um, everything together. Um, the, the you know the expertise that they were bringing to bear was obviously vital, but above and beyond that was the the way that they built those relationships. So, for example. And, and I'm imagining that this is the case here. You're the expert on this particular thing, but there's the difference between a transactional partnership and one where you're actually solving problems is where you can uh, rely and trust on the people that you're bringing in to help to be super responsive to changes that happen as, as you go through, because obviously that's inevitable. You can say, right, here's what we're gonna do. Here's a brilliant map, here's the plan. And then you go, into battle and obviously everything changes almost instantly now the strength of your partnership will determine whether you're you know the people that you're uh, inviting in to help you will uh, get bogged down in contract negotiations as soon as change happens or work with you really proactively to solve the problems first and then and then worry about you know the rest of it afterwards it feels to me from reading everything and listening to everything that um that that was the power of this and that success was driven by the the really collaborative way that they were able to build a partnership rather than a transaction does That's, that make sense no that can make complete sense and you're absolutely right Rom. there was accenture as well who was the third kind of partner at the and they designed the the app and and the new website for, for all of this and yeah the, the three key elements of this project so that the back end stuff with vestanaka and SA, sap and building out kind of the really core technology base for this and then Naveo, as you said, Ron, with the e-commerce platform and then Accenture with the front end, the, those partners have played critical roles in each of those phases. And what was interesting as well, just on a final point on this, is how they were selected. So they said, well, we, we chose Naveo because they did something pretty much, or they did a very similar project with a retailer in Finland. Vestanaka had a use case with a, a um, similar company to selling in Norway. So they were also looking at companies who had gone and done something similar, obviously not within the time frame. The time frame was unique, really, but um, a similar kind of project. So yeah, it's um, it was definitely collaboration in its truest sense. James, I'm interested. Do you think we as consumers will ever go back to writing our food and shopping lists down on bits of paper and going, going to the store and walking up and down the aisles and spending a good couple of hours of our lives doing that? I, I just... I cannot see that ever happening. Well, you know, obviously it will happen, but trends and behaviors are changing so much that this kind of e-commerce home delivery stuff is only going to be more kind of critical for retailers, right? Yeah, I mean, you're going to see the, the balance shift. I mean, I, st I don't know about you guys. I still go. I just, I know, I'm more than prepared to get, up, get my car and I go have a wander around a supermarket. That's how interesting my life is at the moment. But... I, but you know what is undeniable is we're going to see more and more people shift to to prefer to do it online. But with then if that is true, and I think it is, we come back to the the point that was made right at the start of this this sort of conversation, which is the economics of of home delivery and retailers are undeniably going to have to find some efficiencies and whether that's you know sort of using RPA or automation within within you know part of that supply chain or or whatever it is and, and customers are you know they're going to demand more idea about where the food is from is it sustainably grown and those costs go on top as well and look, in, in the uk i think if not the cheapest it's some of the cheapest food available in western europe i think if we if we do want this level of convenience and you know this sort of bird's eye view about where all our food is from where it's sourced then, then we're we're probably going to have to pay more for it as well because I don't think that the, the sums add up completely. It, 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 I mean, long term maybe they'll save money on the bricks and mortar of it, but we we know that a lot of the time home delivery is the loss leader. So if that's what we're going to be expecting the whole time, then the, then the sums don't add up. So it, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's going to have to be a shift somewhere along the line because 
if we just want all of it done online all the time, that it doesn't work. It doesn't add up. People aren't going to make money on one end. And, you know, what's the producer, the farmer going to make and stuff like that. So I think the whole economics of grocery, retail, food and retail, we'll, we'll, we're going to see a big change there. And I think technology will have a huge part to play in that, of course. And it's interesting to see how, I don't want to talk about them again, but Amazon are muscling in on this space and off, <laughs> offering free or like next day delivery from Morrison, certainly in our local area. Um, I think Deliveroo offer services for, with maybe a couple of supermarkets as well. So third party delivery companies coming in and, and um, you know, may, maybe filling, filling the gaps that the retailers can't actually do themselves. Anyway, no, um, cheers chaps. That, that was a, a good discussion. We're going to move on now, but if you want to go deep on selling groups, turbocharged transformation, you can access all of the content over at digitalbulletin.com. Next up, we explore the topic of AI-driven identity verification. Power up your day with the Bulletin Brief, the latest news, insights, and opinion delivered straight to your inbox. For this month's interview, I caught up with Bala Kumar, Chief Product Officer for Jumio. Jumio uses some very smart technology to deliver identity verification. Recently, the company undertook some research into the sharing economy, looking at the importance of ID verification as ride and food hailing services become more and more popular. In the interview, we discuss why artificial intelligence and machine learning are essential to delivering ID verification and how seriously organizations like Uber and Deliveroo should be approaching this topic. But first, I asked Bala about the main problem to have been highlighted by Jumio's study. I think it comes down to one thing. Trust, trust and safety, I would say. Um, because when you think about the sharing economy, you're talking about real world individuals getting together uh, in a physical space, in a shared physical space. And when you're in that type of an environment, you want to make sure that, especially when you're interacting with strangers, that there's a certain degree of trust. And when you, especially if you think about ride sharing um, organizations, you want to make sure when you get into that vehicle, you're getting into the vehicle with someone you can trust. And this is not a one-way street. It goes both ways. So companies like an Uber, they want to make sure that um, they are interacting with the right types of passengers. They're interacting with folks that are not going to get in a car and carjack um, somebody that they can um, feel comfortable with as they get them from point A to point B. On the other hand, the folks who are using these apps, who are using these organizations, when they get into the vehicle, they want to make sure that they are going to be transacting or they're going to be traveling in a vehicle with somebody that uh, they can feel comfortable with and more importantly, feel safe with. So it comes back to that fundamental point, which is trust. We did uh, quite a bit of um, an analysis of this and we did a research with uh, YouGov and our research found that um, when it comes to ride-sharing apps, a significant population are not confident um, in the UK uh, that the driver is who they claim to be, right? So it, it, it really only about 26% of uh, the UK population that has um, some confidence about the uh, folks. You're right, Bala, the, the numbers are really stark, aren't they? So that there is a problem. Now let's talk about the solution. And one of the solutions is technology, artificial intelligence. How could AI help give users more assurances around people's identities? Yeah, we, you know, often terms you hear machine learning, AI, et cetera, is going to solve the world's problems. To some degree, that is true, but it becomes more true when you're able to deal with uh, a large chunks of data, when you have large volumes of data and especially large vol volumes of truth data because understanding the difference between um, truth data and just some data is critical, right? And the systems need to learn. For humans, individuals, it's relatively easier when you're uh, asked question A or one question or two questions. Here you're asking the machine to go process thousands of questions in real time. And for it to be able to do an effective job there, it needs to be able to distinguish between good and bad. And, um, just given the scale at which these organizations are growing, um, given the scale at which organizations uh, like ourselves are growing in terms of the identity verification processing, et cetera, there's tons of intelligence that's starting to come in. So in the past where we could lean on rules-based systems, 
uh, but that had um, some degree of error rates by introducing machine learning, by introducing AI uh, to how we are processing the data and how we are distinguish distinguishing and categorizing the data between good and bad, it makes it a lot more effective in automatically um, making a decision in real time, right? Because I mean, think about it. You open up your app, you click a button, you say you put your destination in, and within a couple of seconds, it pops up and says, yep, the vehicle is so, um, so, so a couple of minutes away or 10 minutes away or whatever it is. For the system to be able to process all the data in real time and say, yeah, this is an individual you can trust. And here's someone else you can trust within a, a, a X radius and connecting the two of them needs to happen very quickly. And that's where solutions like AI make a huge difference because they're constantly learning every transaction that comes in, every right share that is approved adds to that intelligence. So uh, it's, it's not um, realistically possible to be able to do that in a non-AI world, especially with the expectations around response times and expectations around the accuracy of these uh, solutions. So Bala, how does, how does Jumio fit into this puzzle? Tell us what it is that your company offers. Yeah, so Jumio is uh, very much an end-to-end AI-powered identity verification and authentication service. And for us, it, it really comes down to a couple of things. How do we enable trust? And how do we enable trust with a high degree of confidence in a short interval of time? That's our primary driver. Every single customer we work with, every single transaction that we support, manage is centered around that. So we provide, like I said, an end-to-end -end AI powered solution, uh, both for identity verification and authentication. What that means is the first time somebody shows up, the first time they furnish a government issued ID, whether it's a driver's license or whether it's a passport or a national ID card, um, the very first time we are quickly verifying the authenticity of that document. And once we have done that, we are also leveraging biometrics. So we have the individual take a selfie. We check to see if the selfie that was taken matches the picture that's on the document, all this in real time. And within a matter of seconds, we are providing that signal back with, yep, we feel confident or no, there's something risky here. Once that is done, that's the initial identity verification component. Now on an ongoing basis, it becomes important for customers to continue to authenticate that that individual is still who they claim to be. And that's where the biometrics comes into play because we have captured the biometric. Now we are able to, <clears throat> in real time, be able to take another selfie, establish a new fingerprint for that selfie and compare that back with the fingerprint that we have on file for the original biometric that was taken, right? So as you can imagine, this is, we're talking about thousands and thousands of transactions. We're talking about uh, several million uh, selfies and IDs that we have captured over the years. And in real time, we are running checks against all of these. We are able to come back and say, yep, this looks good, or something is uh, super suspicious here and you need to do something about it. It's not limited to just um, being able to take a selfie, right? I mean, when you take a selfie, it's possible that, you know, they can have a perhaps a mask on or perhaps they're holding a picture up to the camera. It's important to detect the liveness of that particular situation, right? And so when they're taking the selfie, it's, it's more than just capturing the picture but we are also doing a liveness detection to ensure that that new customer is physically present when they are furnishing that ID and when they are creating that account. These are very critical uh, components of, again, providing the trust. So there is higher degree of confidence um, on both, on, uh, with both parties, with both the uh, uh, ride-sharing organization and also the passengers who are going to be using the, uh, using the service. Uh, we are starting to, of course, expand this out from beyond just the selfie and the identities. We are, we are bringing in additional risk layers um, because let's face it, we are dealing with some very sophisticated fraudsters, right? This is not um, amateurs. Yes, there are a few amateurs that try to see if they can get a free ride every now and then, but uh, we are also dealing with sophisticated fraudsters, uh, fraud rings, and uh, these guys know what they're doing. They're constantly testing out uh, different solutions. They're constantly looking for vulnerabilities. And when they find these, well, they also share it with their uh, friends because that's how they operate, right? You give to get, you share today, and tomorrow somebody else is going to share uh, other vulnerabilities with you. And that's how these individuals have been getting stronger. These fraud rings have been getting stronger. Um, and so it is very critical uh, for us to have um, a solution 
that's constantly uh, innovating, that's constantly improving. It goes back to what I said earlier around machine learning and AI. These are constantly learning systems. You got to feed it um, good data. You need to feed it through data on a regular basis. Uh, that's only going to make it even better over time. Um, and um, fact be told, our solutions have helped, helped companies verify more than 170 million identities worldwide. I imagine the opportunity is great because this industry, the sharing economy, companies like Uber, you know, it's, it's previously been viewed as maybe a bit of a wild west when it comes to regulation and this kind of thing. Do you see these companies taking this issue really seriously and how seriously should they take it going forward? It's obviously of, of, of vital importance, isn't it? It absolutely is, right? Uh, there are There's so much at stake if they don't take this seriously. Like I just said, the reputational damage to them itself could be pretty significant. Um, and um, uh, the way the economy is growing, uh, there are, uh, there's a startup every other day, right? And so it is very easy for companies, new entrants to come in and disrupt the model. So companies, if they don't take this seriously, if they don't um, provide that degree of confidence and assuredness to their, to their end users, uh, they will start losing out very quickly. Um, our research also shows that um, two out of five UK adults, so that's about 40, 42% there, they want the driver or the host or that deliverer of services to have their identities checked regularly. So it's not just the first time when somebody is verifying, authenticating, and creating an account, but on a regular basis, they want these individuals to be screened because things could change, right? And so it is. Um, it, the, the research clearly shows that uh, this is something that they are expecting, so they have higher degree of confidence with these uh, organizations that they interact with. One of the, um, you know, as we did the survey, one of the more popular responses that we saw was how often employees should verify their identity, right? It's, and every time, not that, not just the first time, but every time that they use the app, and that number was about 23%, so almost a quarter, right? They want them to do this every time. This may seem to be excessive, but it's a clear preference, right? And that again comes back from one perspective, which is trust. It comes from that uh, need for feeling safe when you're using these services, right? And, um, you know, interestingly, it was, uh, they're looking for these companies to check at, you know, that 25% rate. Um, but, you know, as you start breaking down and say, how frequently do you want to check? Uh, once a week was at about um, uh, 13%. And once a month was even lower than that, right? So there is a clear expectation out there uh, that these service providers are responding to what the consumers are asking for, what they're demanding uh, for them to feel confident. But at the same time, you know, imagine having to verify yourself so many times, they have to provide a good seamless experience so it doesn't become a hindrance. So they're trying to balance a couple of things. One, build trust and confidence in the folks that are using these. Two, how do you do, do it in a way that it is not causing too much friction for you? Right. So it's a, it's a tall ask, but that's ex exactly what consumers, users are demanding. Um, and as I said at the start, it's a two-way street and it's not just verifying and feeling confident about one part of the equation. You have to feel strong, trusted and confident about both parties that are involved in that uh, transaction. Thank you to Bala for that interview. And that is a wrap listener on episode 21 of the Digital Bulletin podcast. Now, our elves are busy prepping the next issue of our magazine, which will hit the digital shelves next week. So look out for that. So we also recently published a cracking issue of our sister publication, Tech for Good, featuring case studies with JP Morgan and NHS Blood and Transplant. Believe me, it's well worth a look. And the Tech for Good podcast is back for series two. Just search on all the normal pod platforms for that. Last but not least, thank you to today's panel. Romilly, thank you. No problem. Anytime. Maybe next time. Goodbye. Maybe on time next time would be good. James, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get that in there. Fine. Yeah, I don't, don't think there's much chance of that, but thank you very much. And to you two, listener, thank you. We'll be back in a month's time. That was the Digital Bulletin Podcast. 
listen and subscribe to a range of podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. Plug in for news, features and case studies on the very latest in enterprise technology and digital transformation. 